It is past 5 p.m. in the Philippines. I am Laya Bukirin from the Nayong Filipina Foundation. So since this morning, we've been having a series of conversations on the need for more biodiversity champions who will help us in our clamor for urban parks. And for this episode, we are fortunate to have leaders from World Urban Parks, the Europe Park Federation, and the Wirral Metropolitan Borough Council as our guests. This Umpukan Sanayon, or community gathering, was organized so that we can ask the public, do you want parks? Parks are not just for healing, leisure, wellness, but parks will also serve as a biodiverse hub and a platform for citizen-led conservation. So we are gathered here today to seek recommendations for the Nayong Filipino Cultural Park. It's in the new Seaside Road in Entertainment City in Paranaque. And last October 2019, the national government approved the development of the Nayong Filipino Cultural Park and Creative Hub. Um, that's, that was the original intent. And it was only this January when we announced the vision for this to house permanent and temporary exhibitions, performances, multimedia content, and other activities that would highlight various facets of the country's nat natural and cultural heritage. The property has high market values. However, it has also been identified with high cultural, historical, heritage, and ecotourism values because of its proximity to the Las Piñas Paranaque Critical Habitat and Ecotourism Area, or the La Papachea. So the Nayong Filipina Foundation started a series of multi-sectoral consultations, not just for the physical development, but also for conceptualizing our programs for the park that we must carefully consider in the design process. We have already started the initial conceptual designs and we wanted to proceed with a master plan so that we can remain true to our mandate aligned with the mainstreaming of natural and cultural heritage conservation. But then an enhanced community quarantine was declared in March 2020 due to the rising number of COVID-19 positive cases in the Philippines. So today, a portion of the property has been designated as a mega quarantine facility for asymptomatic patients. However, while in crisis, we also have the opportunity to consult the public, have more conversations like this, and look at international cases in charting the right way forward. So before we begin this session, may I first introduce our Executive Director, Attorney K. Malilong Esperto, to share a few words. Hi. Um, good, I don't know, good afternoon or good morning. Uh, hi, from, <laughs> hi to all of you and thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we've been talking about building a world-class park in Metro Manila. Um, we don't really have a lot of green and open spaces here. Uh, we don't know what does that mean. So this afternoon, uh, we hope to hear from you what your minimum requirements are for a park uh, to be acceptable. So um, we, we are learning. Um, we are near a Ramsar site. So we thought that that design should emphasize that. At the same time, um, Creating a park management system is one of the goals of Nayong Pilipino. So Nayong Pilipino Foundation is uh, a foundation founded by um, the by first lady, the former first lady Imelda Marcos. So this is one of her projects. So Nayong Nayon means a uh, village, uh, and the idea I suppose when she created this this was uh, to show um, a Philippine village to the world. What does that mean in 2020 uh, with threats of climate change and the pandemic? Uh, obviously, we will need to change that. And so, well, uh, the, we originally had funding of about 35 million euro to develop a nine hectare site. Um, we don't have that right now since the money was used for COVID response. But what we have is time uh, to design it in such a way to make it a space that's useful for a world that's um, hit by a pandemic. So I guess it's a pandemic ready place that we need to design. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for that, Attorney Kay. I would just like to introduce uh, the med moderator for this episode. I'd like to call on Ms. Nella Lamotan of Philippine Parks and Biodiversity, our partner. 
Thank you so much. And uh, I would like to apologize in advance if there are noises that you could hear. I actually live in a remote area in Palawan. It's one of the most biodiverse places in the Philippines, but also at the same time, very poor connection. Um, so I had to travel far away to, 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 to go to town and it's quite noisy. But good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much for being here with us from those in the Philippines and to partners and to speakers from uh, different parts of the globe. We really are very humbled by your presence. You know, when, when Nayong Filipino Foundation and us at the Philippine Parks and Biodiversity started talking about the concept of urban parks, it really excited us because the metropolitan Manila, there's barely any parks, there's barely any green. You Google it and it's really like a concrete jungle. But people, more and more people are realizing and understanding that we cannot have concrete jungles that don't take into consideration sustainable development or the wildlife that can thrive, uh, native plants, uh, indigenous trees. Um, every time I visit other countries, I'm really amazed by how so much, like uh, just five minutes away from from where you live, you're, you're near a park. You're near so much greens. And it's just so amazing. Like Neil showed the top three uh, cities to live in and uh, what's common amongst them is like the, the the green that's all around right it really takes into consideration the health and well-being of its citizens and it's about time that manila goes towards that that we take into consideration the health and well-being of all citizens and so we're very very glad to have this discussion um with everyone so yeah i just really wanted to say how excited i am for this and we look forward to having this session with you all so Yes, we could formally start, right, Laya? Yes, we can. Okay. I am as stoked as you are. So I would just like to introduce our speakers, our guests, uh, who uh, generously gave their time uh, to us this afternoon. So let me start with Mr. Neil McCarthy. Neil is an international leader in natural resource management with a strong focus on policy strategy, especially parks and waterways. And he has extensive understanding experience in the complexities required to achieve balance between environment and development for the betterment of the community. Neil held a number of operational, strategic, and corporate executive roles in Parks Victoria before becoming the CEO of the Northeast Catchment Management Authority in Victoria. He was originally educated in forest science with the University of Melbourne. He has an MBA in government policy and reform from Monash University and did further executive study at MIT in the US. Neil has been recognized for many of his contributions and was the World Urban Parks 2016 Distinguished Individual Award recipient. So Neil McCarthy is a CEO of World Urban Parks, Executive Director at Mosaic Insights and Co-Chair of the International National Park City Committee. Ladies and gentlemen, we bring in Neil McCarthy. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for that introduction. And hopefully I've been able to share my screen. I've got a, a brief uh, set of slides. So it's fantastic to be here. And it's really good to have that uh, uh, vision and ambition that you have to actually make uh, your cities and hopefully the cities in the Philippines, you know, a lot more vibrant and a lot more healthier for everyone. I do represent World Urban Parks, but luckily um, one, of, one of our key leaders, Mary, is also uh, on the panel as well. So she could probably talk about uh, a couple of special special areas such as large urban parks committee and older adults uh, approach. But World Urban Parks, um, is the peak body for urban parks uh, around the world. We advocate for better outcomes for cities by using parks and nature for the benefit of uh, all people in the community. So parks for all. We're about best practice. We're about collaboration. So people working together, not just across the sector, but across all sectors, be it health, education, not-for-profit business as well. And we really do focus on leadership and legacy, which I'll come back to briefly. But I'm just going to go through some really quick points that hopefully get the conversation going um, 
this afternoon. Well, it's, it's evening for me um, in, in Melbourne. And I actually luckily live in one of the best cities in the world in terms of parks. But if you're going to create a great city, you need to have a great park system. But that park system has to reflect the heart and the soul of the city, of the place. And, and there are certain cities that have done that extremely well. Paris, well, Singapore, Melbourne have done that extremely well. You, you also have to connect it to everyone who lives in the city. And we've, we've been talking internationally about from your balcony or from your front door. So where you live, the moment that you go outside, you become connected to the environment some in some manner and therefore get a connection to your parks and open space and hopefully um, the great site that you're about to develop. Um, you'll also find that the, the most livable cities uh, in the world generally have a really significant open space system that uh, exists. Uh, some of those have actually come about because of previous pandemics and Melbourne's a very good example of that. In the 1880s, we had a massive cholera pandemic. It led to a complete reform of the city and, and in that moment in the 1880s, they created this open space network. New York was the same with Central Park in the 1860s. Paris was the same uh, as well. So, so Really, you know, we do know that open space has always played a major role in keeping cities safe and healthy. And this COVID-19 pandemic around the world has really highlighted that. There, there's a lot of very good documentation about the value of parks and nature in cities and, and also in terms of the protected area network. But through the pandemic, everyone's starting to realise how important it is. And, and most governments are now coming to grips with that. They're struggling to know what to do next uh, with it. World Urban Parks has been producing a lot of resources with our global partners. And that would be true of Euro Parks as well in terms of how to respond to COVID-19. A lot of that is about the initial response, but we, with our global partners, uh, the IUCN, ICLE, the National Park City Foundation, uh, Salzburg Global Seminar, with the support of the National Recreation and Parks Association of the USA, have actually just recently released a blueprint for future recovery, where to go, what to do, what you need, to cover. And a key component of that is your, your design of your city, of your parks, and designing it for legacy by creating a compelling vision that is about the city, about the people in the city. And in that, you do need to connect to where the people live and before you actually build it and give them a reason to participate in it. Um, there's a very good example in Singapore, you know, um, which, which is called Hort Park. And it was designed because of the love of the Singaporeans for their greenery, for their, for their gardens. They actually designed a park that's both a botanical garden and education biodiversity centre, as well as learning about plants um, and growing plants. So from a World Urban Parks perspective, it's great to be here and I'm looking forward to the conversation. But I always ask this question, what will your legacy be and what will you do for your city? And I think they'll be very important things to consider. So thanks and I'll hand it back um, to our chair. Thank you so much, Mr. McCarthy. Uh, the insights will really inspire us in making the city more livable. and consider in, in, in how to consider these principles you shared and the question you shared uh, for the design of the Nayong Pilipino Foundation Park. Uh, the next resource uh, speaker that we have uh, is Mr. Ignace Schops. Uh, Ignace is, a, is an environmentalist and he is the director of an 
a civil society organization in Belgium, and he is also the president of Europark Federation. Europark is the largest network on natural heritage in Europe, and, if, and um, Ignaz is also a full member of the European chapter of the Club of Rome and Rewilding Europe Circle. Um, in 2017, he was selected in the top 25 of most influential Belgians in the world by Charlie Magazine, and in 2019, his organization was awarded by the Flemish Parliament with a Golden Honorary Award for long-lasting, outstanding environmental achievements. Egnias Shops and his team designed the Reconnection Model. This model reconnects society with natural heritage and is used in several countries in the world. Ignaz is often asked as expert and keynote speaker as interna in international conferences related to natural heritage, biodiversity, climate change, sustainable development, and social entrepreneurship. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Ignaz Shops. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining this, uh, I think, inter interesting uh, yeah, conference. Um, I must say I am now approximately 10,500 kilometers away from Manila, if you take Brussels as the capital of, of Europe. So, and still we are so closely connected now. Uh, luckily, we can do that uh, nowadays. And it's good to have these discussions. Um, as I was uh, introduced, and thank you for the introduction, uh, Lila, um, I'm so happy to, to share with you that uh, I am for the last five years, I am president of Europark Federation, which is indeed the largest network uh, of protected areas in Europe. Uh, to give you a, a, a clue of how big it is, it is uh, approximately over 400 members in 40 European countries, and we manage uh, yeah, over 40 million hectares of protected land and also marine areas, which is approximately 8% of the European surface. Uh, so I think, and what, what is interesting there is that of, of, within these protected areas, there are a lot of uh, protected areas who are inside or close to cities as well. So we call it peri-urban parks or urban parks it could be. Um, and myself, so we designed the first and only national park Belgium has uh, uh, in, until date. It's also a peri-urban park because it's uh, very close to yeah, 8 million people who are living at just one hour uh, car drive. Um, but what is interesting, I think, in, uh, for, for this conference is that we can learn from each other. And it was, I think, just in the 10 minutes before the conference started, so it's about how can we network? Is there a possibility also in the Philippines maybe to create a, 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 a urban park network within the Philippines? Because exchanging is something very, I think, useful and also um, interesting to get new insights. And that's what Europark Federation tries to do. We are a learning network. Uh, where consultation and participation is very, very key for yeah, making our policies for the, uh, for the future and also to learn from each other. We are kind of, of living labs, of course. And maybe before um, I would say start a discussion, I would uh, refer to something interesting, what is uh, at every place in the world maybe interesting. Uh, I think it was five or six years ago, the World Trend Watchers, they held also their world conference and they had a big theme and there was a, a question, and the big question was there, how to become successful in the future? And the conclusion of the World Trend Watchers uh, for the three-day conference was, if you want to become successful in the future, you need to be latte-proof. And we all know latte macchiato from the coffee, of course, but uh, latte is an acronym uh, for local, authentic, traceable, trustworthy and ethical. And that's, I think, exactly what we need to take into account to design the future based on nature's design because yeah, the, the, our planet is now 4.5 4, 4. Uh, billion years as research and development there. So with trial and error. So we have to listen to the voice of our planet and use that as a mechanism, as a, as a design for starting uh, again, uh, for sure, in, uh, in Manila, I think we need to green Manila, to green ourselves and from COVID to love it. Huh? Okay, I'll, I'll leave it with this. Thank you for these insights, Ignaz. From COVID to love it. Yes, indeed, we need that in Manila and we need to listen to the forest. Uh, like 
um, the public, I'd like the attendees to help us mainstream the latte principle that Ignas shared with us. So thank you for this. Um, I'd like to introduce the third panelist that we have. She is Dr. Mary Worrell. She is Senior Manager of Parks, Coast, and Countryside at the Wirral Metropolitan Borough Council. Uh, for her doctorate, Dr. Worrell has researched professional and management development in England's public park sector and identified key issues uh, that she's now using uh, in her current uh, office. Um, Dr. Worrell manages a team of 190 staff responsible for over 240 parks and green and blue spaces. How amazing. Uh, so this include coastal and inland sites of special scientific interest, town and country parks. And Dr. Worrell also works to propose Birkenhead Park as a potential work World Heritage Site. Dr. Worrell has been active, has been an active Green Flag Award judge since 2004, assessing and promoting good park standards nationally and internationally. We need that in the Philippines. Uh, Dr. Worrell recently completed three years in office with the World Urban Parks Association as a co-chair of the Older People and Parks Advocacy Committee. And she leads the World Health Organization joint project with uh, World Urban Parks in order to identify and promote international examples of good practice for the design of parks to promote involvement of older people and needs. And she's also a member of the World Urban Parks International League uh, Large Parks Committee, and uh, she has provided inputs about Birkenhead Park for the soon to be published book about the world's large parks edited, edited by Dr. Richard Mire from Sweden. We look forward to this publication, certainly. So ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Mary Worrell. Thank you very much. I think it might be helpful um, to start by, by saying that um, I know how important urban parks are because I'm a child that grew up in an urban area in the West Midlands of, of England. And if it wasn't for urban parks um, my life would have been very different. I had the advantage of a formal park and also um, an informal nature area and it, it really shaped my experience as a child and uh, has made me aware of how important these areas are as I've, as I've uh, developed my career. Um, I have a quite a wide-ranging background. I've been involved at a UK level in the development of community woodlands and uh, the Community Forest Programme, um, which exists in the UK. Um, I've also worked for the uh, heritage organisation, government heritage organisation for the UK, for, for England, called Historic England now, um, in a training development role. Very interesting there. I worked in a London local authority and chaired the London Parks and Green Space Forum, uh, which is uh, an amazing opportunity, really uh, important network there. Um, I've been in Ethiopia and I know a little about uh, Addis Ababa's breathing space parks and the importance of those for the, the local communities. And um, now I am um, on the Wirral, which is within the Liverpool city region. We are in um, 60 square miles surrounded by two major rivers and um, the sea. We have Ramsar sites and um, a very wide range of parks and countryside areas, um, small, large, and um, as has been mentioned, Birkenhead Park, which was one of the original um, public parks created by a municipality, by, by, a, by a local authority. Um, the, the inspiration when Birkenhead was being created as a new area um, uh, as part of the Industrial Revolution was that without a place for people to um, have breathing spaces to have the experience of, of, of what we now call parks, um, cities are unlivable. And um, right from the foundation of um, the urban areas in the UK, that issue has played out. So um, parks are really important and that's why Britain has a lot of them. And in the UK they are under threat from development of all sorts. So although we have a lot of them, we also have uh, key issues which we need to address to make sure that cities and towns can remain um, healthy and sustainable for the future. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Worrell. I will now uh, turn over the floor, um, the screen rather, to our partner, Philippine Parks and Biodiversity, Ms. Nella Namotan. Thank Nella. you so much. Thank you so much, Laya. And just hearing our speakers really excites me to have this discussion. I'm sure the attendees are very excited. So to begin, uh, we have three main questions and um, you guys actually have shared a bunch of uh, reasons already for the one of the questions, but let me just uh, ask that again so that you could uh, delve deeper into it. So the first question is, what is the importance of urban parks in cities? How can policymakers ensure that there are urban parks for the public? Uh, Mary just brought up that some, are, some lands are being cut into uh, be converted unsustainably or to not be used as a park, right? So I'm sure all of us also go through that challenge. So maybe Ignas, you could start with uh, that answer. What is the importance of urban parks and how can policymakers ensure that there are parks for the public? Yeah, I think, thank you for giving me the floor again. So yeah, it, it cannot be underestimated, of course, the, the importance of green areas, urban parks, close to where people live huh? and it starts at your doorstep I would say and uh, of course what we see in Metro Manila that is uh, of, let's say what you I think you, you called it uh, like a concrete jungle where you now to have to in yeah to incorporate and to design yeah the, the, the green jungle again so I think um, for the audience of the day uh, that most of us who are listening to, to this conference, they are already convinced that biodiversity and green spaces are so important for our, our, our human health and our, and, and our environments. The question often is, how can we convince decision makers to, to do the right thing, which is, yeah, do something for nature, do something for wildlife. And um, when I, and I, of course, it's maybe more a European approach, but what helped at least in Europe is that we started to give an, uh, we start to translate biodiversity into an other language, not the language, but just an other language that politicians really understand. And that's the money language. And it's not, it's a difficult one in, in, on the one hand side, but on the other hand, it's a simple one because if you calculate the socioeconomic benefits and the health benefits of wild spaces or green spaces of urban parks in cities or in uh, near near cities, then you come to the conclusion that the benefits are really huge. And that is just a, a small percentage that an, a, a government investment is needed to have all these benefits. Uh, there are so many uh, scientific uh, research done recently and also publications that make the relation between, for sure now in COVID times, that make the relation with green and how just hiking or just a walk of, of 15 to 30 minutes a day can really uh, reduce uh, heart attacks or uh, depression uh, uh, or the dementia or the diabetes. There's so many things that we can use. And I think we need to, to speak to those decision makers with the words they can understand the best because I do it for, let's say, the intrinsic values. And I think most of us do that. But it helps when we try to translate it into a language that it is uh, even, uh, yeah, let's say, uh, more uh, interesting for politicians, uh, pol yeah, for politicians and decision makers to make the decision they need to make. It's a greener, a healthier city. Like I think Neil was saying, uh, healthy people live in a healthy city. Yeah, I have to agree with you, um, Ignas. And I actually am curious, like you mentioned about the translating into the social economic benefits, right? So is that, do you mean that we need to show them that it could also bring in money through tourism is that one aspect yes. or, I, I, yeah. I will tell you i will tell you my story yeah in, in belgium i'm a herpetologist i don't know if everybody know what it is a herpetologist mm -hmm. i did a lot of research on frogs and lizards and snakes mm -hmm. and, but that was 30 years ago but even then i was a lobbyist as well so i went to ministers to try to convince them of the wildlife case and i told <laughs> stories about tree frogs and midwife toads and snakes but all of these ministers, they couldn't make any policy of a story of a tree frog. <laughs> so that's why I came to the conclusion that, oh, I need to speak the language they speak. So what I did, so firstly, 
I, we developed the first and only national park in Belgium, which is uh, 6,000 hectares. So in, in, in relation to the world, it's, it's a very small one. It's also peri-urban parks near to cities, uh, as I told you. But what we did is we calculated the socioeconomic benefits of that 6,000 hectares uh, park. And the result is un incredible. Right? Every year, the benefits of this park is 191 million euros and 5,000 jobs are connected directly and indirectly. And suddenly, minister said, hey, come in, drink a coffee. How did you do it? What, how, <laughs> how can we learn of it? And, and for me, I'm still telling the story of the tree frog, but for them, it's an economic story. And that's what we need to learn, to, to need to learn, not to, to let, uh, let's say money take over because there's no business on a dead planet, but just to use this kind of, let's say, evidence-based and also evidence uh, to, to convince those who are not convinced yet. Great, great. Thank you so much for that insight. I definitely agree. And uh, I'm sure I'm sure Laya and the NPF team are also thinking of ways you could already approach this in this angle. Um, how about you, Neil? Do you want to add anything uh, into the discussion? Uh, yeah, look, I, I can probably add a, a few extra things. Yeah, clear, clearly what's been sort of articulated is that there's been a lot of work done on the, the values of parks, be it the socioeconomic, uh, environmental values and developing that, that case. And there's some very good examples around the world of doing that. But when, when you look at why cities end up with the exceptionally great open space, you know, parks and nature. It's either been because they've responded to a, a um, catastrophe. So, and Mary, Mary was talking about the industrial revolution. You know, it, it was a, it was a problem. So the, the solution was we'll start creating parks. Um, you know, the cholera typhoid pandemics of the 1800s, you know, so we responded. Now, those cities that responded then, so when you look at Melbourne, we responded then, we actually suddenly realised how valuable parks were and therefore we actually started to develop our city uh, that way. Or you have a, but there, it's a leadership role, but it's a leadership when you have a disaster, which is probably not the right time. You should do it before you have the disaster. Mm -hmm. You've got the leadership of where the individual, and Singapore's a very good example of this, they realised that you know, if they'd made their city green, it was just going to be better. And they started that long process. That was a real leadership. They didn't have anything that we've been talking about, the economic benefits of doing it, but you now look at Singapore and you actually go, Geez, it's a great place. You know, it's got incredible parks. It's it, it's green. It's lush. It feels comfortable, and it's actually uh, economically uh, doing extremely well. So there is about leadership, and but then you still have to construct the value proposition as we we describe it. You know, so if you do something, it's that same argument. Will it bring in? more economic value to the city. Now, in that, it just doesn't have to be, let's say, tourism. It can be, and this is where Healthy Parks, Healthy People, as an example, came about, it was actually solving critical health problems. Obesity, chronic heart disease, they are all pre preventable, as we know. The evidence shows that they are. Best way to prevent them is actually get people active. Therefore, you need open space, nature, and now the mental health benefits of nature are, are massive. So, so you've actually got to go to these other sectors and get them to own the problem, but you become part of the solution. Therefore, over time, over a 50 year period, if you're successful, you'll suddenly have a really vibrant green city. Right. Thank you so much for that. I'm, I'm just curious, actually, that gave me an insight because we've been discussing how we could create an alliance um, for urban parks right here. And so definitely we also need the medical 
um, aspect of it, right? To to provide scientific data. But I'm just wondering, is that hard to calculate? Um, in your experience, like the studies that show the mental health benefits, how many people actually benefit from it? I mean, I'm, I, I could just imagine that that would take quite a while to calculate. Uh, well, it doesn't now. Um, it, it did when we started about 25 years ago um, because there, there wasn't much research, but now internationally there is a really significant amount of research and, and there's actually more applied research. Mary probably could talk about this in terms of the older adults and World Health Organization. <laughs> but uh, like with the pandemic in Australia, our, our universities are producing nearly weekly the estimates of the impact of mental health of COVID-19, but the value of being out in nature and the economic and the social value of that. So, so a lot of it's there. there, there you would still need to do a fair bit of your own sort of um, research in in your own culture because it's all different and you know uh, we we know that the Japanese if if you take the Japanese as an example their connection with nature is different from a connection an Australian might have or or someone in Europe so you've got to actually allow for that but um, yeah Mary, Mary can probably touch upon this in terms of yeah. some of that recent work as well Great, thank you. So uh, we hand it over to you, Mary. Oh, you're on there mute you there. Perfect. Okay. Am I still? I think it's unmuted now. Yeah. Yes. Yes. You're good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. And um, yeah, just reinforcing what's already been said by Ignace and by Neil, and um, it's quite helpful to be able to put things into categories that can be easily remembered. And um, I often find that having the seven key benefits of parks is a way of doing that. So ecology, the culture, climate, economy, social benefits, health and well-being. Or benefits seven days a week is another way I remember it. So what we've been talking about has, has spoken about those different aspects. And um, I, I definitely support what's been said that it's really important to be able to speak the language of the people that you're seeking to um, explain the benefits to. Um, and it's different things for different people, isn't it? You know, I mean, any conversation within, between two people, you're always trying to find out how, how to make sure that um, you're understanding each other. So it, it's the same as that. Um, so, um, in the UK, one of the things that's been done is to, to show these benefits as flowers. So the, 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 con the concept of a park, because we take it so much for granted in Britain, people say, you know, we look to the UK, tell me, we look to the UK as the home of parks. And yet in Britain or in England, we sort of take them for granted a little bit. So visuals could be really helpful as well. And the, the personal stories can help. But it's about making sure, as people have said, that it's it, you're, you're, you're chiming, you're, you're actually communicating with people rather than uh, speaking at them. <laughs> um, yeah, just picking up on the, the thing about the, the COVID situation and um, older people as well. So um, I'm sure it's, I know it's true in many countries, but in, in the UK, when lockdown happened in March, um, we were only allowed out of our house for one hour uh, healthy exercise a day, um, which is very unusual for, for the UK, you know, to, to have that sort of restriction. And I think it, it, it made people reappreciate how much they rely on our parks and green spaces and our ability to, to get outside and, and be healthy through, through informal exercise. Um, and one of the things that's been found is that the people who have had to be in self-isolation for their, for their wealth, uh, for their health benefits, um, have really, really struggled. Um, but if they've been able to look out of a window and see a good view, a green space, um, some contact with nature one way or another, that that has in itself been beneficial. Um, and one of, the, one of the issues in the UK was because 
uh, people of the age of 70 and above were identified as being in a in a vulnerable category or a very vulnerable category um, they were they were not allowed out of doors um, which was important but also is perhaps a little bit of a, um, a blunt way of doing it so I think that one of the aspects that needs to be taken into account is how not to accidentally discriminate against people um, when thinking about how how can the benefits be provided so anything that talks in sort of global global concepts is likely to have difficulties because at the end of the day it's about you it's about me it's about somebody that we know it's about somebody that we don't know so it's that i know it's a cliche but you know thinking global but also doing things which make sense at a local level for people individuals is really important and we'll get into that i think in some of the other questions too thank you so much mary and uh thank you everyone for your insights uh what what's really coming about is that there's so much benefits of parks i think we all know that uh and it it also takes into account like a multi-stakeholder approach right it can't just be yeah. from us wanting the parks it also has to be the governors leading whoever is in, uh, not, not just the governor, but whoever is in position, also the citizens, right? Um, and, and the clamor from the citizens. So actually that leads me to my second uh, question is about citizen engagement. So we're curious if ever like uh, there was anything significant that you did with citizens that enabled you to create like for Ignas to create a national park or for Mary to, and, and Neil, um, uh, to, to bring about your goals. Um, can you tell us more about citizen engagement for conservation and for uh, urban park development and creation? Um, Ignash, if you could start again. Yes, of course, I, I can try to explain a little bit because there are several uh, examples that we see in Europe mm. and also myself, I have some, mm. uh, some examples. But it starts, of course, and also like Mary said, with, yeah, you have to go to the people firstly to ask what connects really with them huh? because you can say we would like to have people engagement if, but if they are not engaged in the, <laughs> let's say the the example you want to achieve then you have a problem so going to the street going to the houses organize yourself that's the first step and that's also important what i think uh, for the manila case what you would like to achieve now is you know very well, I think, when I saw, uh, let's say, uh, the, the design you want to bring, what you want yourself, and also it's very uh, uh, good uh, argumented and, and, and uh, well, it, well, it's good. But the other thing is how to consult the people from living in Manila. And, and an important group in that is, of course, the elderly, pe the elderly people, but also the youth. That's something we did as Europark Federation. So because everybody is talking about the youth and if we do conferences, they may uh, come up to the scene and they make the downs or whatever, but then they get off of the, of the scene and then we don't listen anymore. So what I did as a president of Europark Federation, we gave them a seat at the highest level of decision-making. So they have a seat in the council uh, in the council of Europark Federation where they have a voice because they are the future. Huh? So we are you are designing a, a futurist park in, in, in Manila. So please keep them, uh, bring them and let them be involved on in what they want to do. Once you have, let's say, done the, 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 the research about how people, and you, you, you can be astonished how good people want and to help also uh, voluntarily to, to create parks, to, to, to learn to each other all, let's say, old craft works that we, 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 we still we have forgotten, so things like that. Uh, then, of course, you need to try to organize it a little bit, streamline it. Um, so how, and, and that's, that's the other thing. Uh, when you try to start a park, uh, an urban park, it's what can we take, what, what are the messages that we can take home? And what is the call to action? Because as I said, it starts at your door, at your flowering pot. Huh? So when you go out to a park, you have to be, let's say, uh, energized there to bring it back home to your families and to broaden the network and, 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 and spread the world that, yeah, working with your hands, do something good for wildlife is not only good for yourself, but also for your children and then for everyone. So that's what we see. And what we, what we see in Europe, at least, is that there is a growing amount of people who are willing uh, voluntarily to, to help out. Uh, the biggest uh, nature conservation organizations who are member organizations, they are growing. They have a really interesting uh, path now 
because the relations between health like and the social economic benefits are now really really proved so you see there the the amount of people is there to help um, now uh, and then that's and that's a good thing of course but then then you can give voice to these people and also bring a statement to those uh, who need to be a decision maker last thing i would like to say is um, if you create a, a new uh, urban park or whatever, you have to show your ambition. And I think the spot on the horizon must be there. Eh? What would we like to become uh, as Manila in the next 30 years or 50 years? What is the spot on the horizon? And as you know, Martin Luther King never started with, I had a nightmare. He always started with, I have a dream. So we have to create that dream and say, okay, and now we are going to live it. And that's something I think you really take, have to take into account to have that dream and to say, okay, there is still tea in 30 years. There is still connection with people in 30 years. We, we, will, we will survive COVID, but then we, we, we create an inclusive society, which is green, which is healthy, and uh, which is, uh, yeah, maybe what I think Mary said already uh, is global, eh? local action for global goals. Leave it with that. Yeah, that's that's really great. Uh, actually, um, I just uh, thought about it that we're discussing about NPF, right? The Nayon Filipino Hub, but in essence, we're really discussing the future of Manila. Like, it's not just about this one spot. The fact that we have set over seven thousand islands, meaning we have so much cities as well, right? And we could have urban parks everywhere. And maybe we're not yet there, but this is a good discussion. And it's good to have that vision. Where do we want to take, not just Manila, actually, or Nayong Filipino Foundation, but the Philippines. Uh, like rewilding Europe. You mentioned something about rewilding Europe. We need to rewild the Philippines, right? So thank you so much. Did you want to say something? Yeah, just it on rewilding. Eh? That's uh, because it's now a new phenomena, uh, phenomenon uh, that, that rewilding cities is coming up now because uh, rewilding nature is something that is really ongoing in, in, in Europe now where we try to because what we see in Europe that also agricultural sector is leaving let's say the, the big uh, big areas in Europe 20 million hectares will become abundant in the next 20 years in Europe so we try to rewild them to give spaces for for nature for wildlife also for holidays in the future because uh, let's say wildlife experiences wildlife uh, um, uh, holidays are re really an expanding in in, in in europe so but the next step is now rewilding cities so a better uh, a rewilding mall you, you don't <laughs> build a mall but now you 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 you, 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 you plant trees huh? And yes. these trees are the, the air conditioners of the city. So there's also, right. you can do a lot of interesting things there. But right. I leave also some, some space for the other speakers. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the insights. Uh, how about Neil? Yeah, the, the question of engagement and how you go about it is really quite an intriguing um, challenge for a lot of people. And as Ignatius uh, stated, Joe, yeah, the ability to give people a, a voice is really critical, but you have to do it in a way where it's it's safe for them to be able to express what they what their vision is, what they're trying to to achieve. And there are really good examples around the world where where that's happened over the last hundred years, where governments have enabled the community to actually le effectively lead. Um, uh, and governments have, have followed. And in a lot of those places, they actually did create uh, uh, really exceptional um, places. But one of the big challenges is actually enabling uh, governments who generally control the development of cities in most places, as well with property developers, um, of giving them uh, mechanisms to enable them to actually improve their engagement processes and I've, I've shared one of the international standards uh, called IAP2, uh, which is uh, the international standard for public participation. And it's got a few different techniques that people can use, but it's still really critical to listen to people of what they want to, to achieve, what they're seeking, what they, how they're 
vision rather than just saying, well, this is what it's going to be because your, your master plan for your own site might evolve dramatically. And, and if it does, it might actually end up being a lot better. And, and I think there are really good cases around the world where people are doing that and, they, and they're actually doing it as they develop. Um, I think there are uh, citywide examples and we just been talking about rewilding, but just thinking about uh, enabling communities to have a voice to actually express how their city should be. The, the National Park City um, concept out of the UK, that, that's a really interesting process to, to actually look at in terms of trying to give a voice to the community about their place and 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 it's only just started so it'll be really interesting over the next 20 or 30 years but but it, and it comes off a really big legacy in that city which includes probably a lot of um, Mary could probably talk about this previous engagement um, of communities and what that means but uh, that process from an outsider seemed to allow a voice to be heard which is really quite quite interesting um, so so to engage people you need to reach out and you need to actually make it safe and uh, allow uh, everyone to have a voice and one, one of the things that I do is I actually always ask the most quiet person in the room because usually they're thinking about it and they might actually have the greatest idea but they can't get their voice to be heard. So sometimes it's really good just to make sure everyone gets an opportunity to express themselves. Great, thank you so much uh, for bringing that up. Actually, one of the things that we want to do together with the Nayan Filipino Foundation is to, and they have also been doing that, is to open up venues where the overall public could uh, give insights on what they want to happen, what do they want to achieve, what do they want to see. But I also, um, really, the uh, the insight that you gave that we need to also provide mechanisms for government and the developers because the lands are technically with them or they have a, a great, uh, they have great influence of how these are developed. And so that's a really great insight. Uh, we need to reach out to them as well. Sometimes I, I think they just don't know uh, like how to go about it. But I mean, I am sure we could provide those mechanisms. So thank you so much. How about you, Mary? Do you want to add anything to that? To citizen yeah, engagement? I was just thinking, mm. Sorry. Um, this is different things in different places, isn't it? And it's, it's about being able to be flexible to um, work with different things. So for example, in, in England, a lot of parks went through a very, very difficult time in the seven, 1970s, 1980s, 1990s. Um, government money was, was, was being pulled out of local authorities. Parks were becoming not well cared for at all. And that led to uh, communities, to individuals creating associations, which were called friends groups, and they still are called friends groups, um, to, to champion um, their park and to, to make people pay attention. <laughs> um, so that's one way, that was people responding to a problem and lobbying, advocating, doing things to, to, to show how important it was. And, and that, that's part of, part of that sort of community participation. Um, the other approach where an organization thinks it would be good to involve people uh, is another approach, isn't it? And Ignatius McCall was talking about um, uh, a call to call to action. So when I was doing community woodlands, uh, not that I knew that that's what I was doing at the time, but when I was reaching out to a local community to see how they could get involved in the woodland on their doorstep, <laughs> um, I often said, you know, this place is a lovely place, but it needs your help to keep it that way, or you know this place has got a lot of potential, but it needs your help to turn that into reality. So um, it's like highlighting the issue and also what it is that people can do uh, to play a part. And some people will want to get involved and other people won't. And 
I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Some people I talk to um, measure whether uh, citizen community input is successful by the number of people that turn up at a particular event, for example. But as an ecologist, I know that um, fantastic things can come from small seeds. <laughs> Um, and also that different ways of interacting are also really important. So I, I think for me, sort of how can communities be involved, citizens be involved, is in lots of different ways, um, both as part of organised groups and as individuals, as people in uh, paid roles, as people as um, volunteers, as people who are just choosing to enjoy a place. So again, that sort of network approach is, is the one that I find um, really, really helpful. In terms of sort of standards, I've, I've, I've put in there the, the Green Flag Award standards because embedded in that quality standard for parks um, is community involvement in design, management and um, appreciation of the park. Um, and um, I think that really makes a difference. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Mary. I actually, uh, with what you said um, about the seeds, what we're doing here, this is a seed. <laughs> this discussion is a seed and what we hope to achieve because this is probably just one of the first discussions to be made about urban parks and really like a transformation that we want to achieve. But we believe that um, if, with the right intention and with the right people, then we could hopefully go towards our goals. And with, of course, collaboration like all of you three have mentioned. Okay, so with our last question, but uh, I see that a lot of uh, participants have actually been uh, active in the chat. So the last question is with regards to this pandemic, right? There's limited movement. And you guys know that um, two hectares of the nine hectare facility, uh, the, the property was co is to be converted into a quarantine facility for asymptomatic patients, right? And we have seven hectares. Um, but with limited movement and with everything on a standstill, what are steps? How could we start? How could we jumpstart and the NPF could jumpstart um, transforming this into an urban park? Is it possible to just convert one hectare, two hectares, one section? Like, what are concrete steps that we could do so that we could start this movement um, while, I mean, even with a pandemic? So, since you, Ignas, you've been first yeah. in all of these. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Thank you. Well, everything you do is good. Oh, I have to wait a moment. Okay, yeah, everything you do, I'm, I'm on. Yeah, everything you do is, is 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 good. And the interesting thing here is that something beautiful can can really blossom out of a problem that you have. For me, this could be an opportunity to connect the dots in the future because this is about city design now. Maybe also for other places in the Philippines, because what you see in the what I can see or try to try to see, I must say like this, is. If you have small dots, small places, just less than an hectare where you can start, let's say, planting trees, whatever it is, uh, make it a small garden, start the two hectares, please start with that because showing how it is possible to transform an area that was maybe foreseen for a mall five years ago, even then, and now it becomes, let's say, green, and then connecting these little spots, connecting the dots with a green infrastructure, as they call it, then you can really start to green the city uh, with yeah, people's consent and with also decision makers' consent. And that's, I think, very, very powerful because people living in these uh, uh, cities in, 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 uh, in, in, in Manila can really support on that. We have very good examples, like Neil said, in other, I think, cities, big cities, how you just start with one species, for instance, let's do something for the bees, like it, uh, the Friends of the Earth did in, in, the, in London. They, they really gathered, I think, 20 million euros to really make a plan just for the bees. So, and this is connecting the dots. Where is the atmosphere? Where is the energy? And sometimes it starts at the, the western si side of the city, maybe at the central star, and, and, and then connecting these dots. And then with the beautiful of connecting the dots is connecting people, because then you have to collaborate with, let's say, the soulmates you, you made, huh? with the family where, where we are with today and say, hey, how can we help? Just little dots. 
starting from your doorstep. Come on, let's do it. Let's do it. See the bigger picture and see the future. And then I think you can really energize yourself as well, because then you have small successes lead then to, let's say, the dream of Martin Luther King, maybe. Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you so much. And it's actually very funny that you mentioned like start with two hectares, one hectare, because um, Kay uh, has, uh, we've been having discussions like what if we transform just like one hectare, two hectares into an urban park, would that suffice? Like, could we start small, right? And I think that val you validated it, that maybe that could be a good direction. Yeah, so thank you. How about Neil? Uh, did you, do you want to add? Uh, how could we start to transform it? What steps could we take? Oh, there's probably a range of really uh, exciting and innovative things you could do. As as it's been pointed out, you could start small. You know, people do talk about you know creating pocket parks. You know, so create a small part of it that that gives a sense of the bigger picture. Even though it'll be years before you'll actually develop the the whole site, but I'd actually go for things that are uh, as well more far reaching. I, I, and we keep talking about this, you know, from your front door, from your balcony, from the doorstep, I'd, I'd reach out to every school and ask them to create their mini version in their school of your concept of what they think your concept should be. I then take the next step and say, well, can you actually grow some of the trees and plants that will eventually get planted on site? So you actually form a, a, a real connection. You know, in, in Australia, we, we basically just go, That's, let's get their hands dirty. We, we know kids love to get out there and do things. So if they make that connection, you're actually growing, and, and as Ignatius said, it's like connecting the dots. You, you're growing a green web through your city. Now, many of these people may never bring their plants to your site because they might actually keep them on their own balcony in their backyard or front yard or convert their nature strip into a more green environment which is actually really good for you anyway. Um, and, and those lateral ideas like, like, like the bees, which, which globally has been taking off, it's happening everywhere around the world. And it's a really simple thing to do to create an insect hotel. Yeah, that, that's become really common. Easy for schools to do it, easy for kids to take it home, you know, to actually do it. That could all be connected back to why? Why? Because we're trying to actually have a livable planet and we're going to have this great park system. We're going to have this great iconic park in Manila that'll actually connect those those bits. I'd actually even then start reaching out to your community because they've probably already got ideas of what they would love to do. And, and you just have to then say, well, go away and find out who could actually make that happen. And let's see what we can do with it. Rather than actually judging them, you actually say, go and try and find the person who will actually help support it, pay for it. You know, Ignatius' um, point about the bees, that, that, that's an exceptional exa example because most government departments who controlled land in, in, and I know in London, you know, probably said, well, that's interesting, but we don't actually have money for it suddenly they went away and got money for it, which actually made it all happen, got a lot of people engaged, you know, and a lot of people actually having their own beehives, you know, and therefore their own honey. It's a real connection with nature. Thank, thank you so much uh, for that insight. Actually, I don't know if Nayong Filipino would want, actually at the Philippine Parks and Biodiversity, we're launching this campaign where we encourage people to plant native trees in their backyards. So uh, um, that just gave me uh, um, an insight to connect this maybe with the NPF, you know, I mean, it starts small. It, it's not just about the, N the Nayong Filipino sites, but also the homes, the residential areas. So thank you so much for that insight. Um, how about Mary? Did you want yeah, to add definitely, anything? Definitely support that. Yeah, um, what people have said already, um, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? I have the same things. So, um, 
yeah, the, the pollinators, the flowers, the folk hotels, insect hotels um, mm -hmm. is one way that people connect. It also can be quite useful because people can, schools and children can use uh, recycling the materials. So it gets that idea of you know, the cycle of life and awareness of all of the waste that we produce whilst using it for something more, more positive. Um, in the UK, the Woodland Trust runs an annual um, What's Your Favourite Tree uh, online competition and it gets on the radio and people sort of, you know, uh, vote for this tree or that tree and it can be done either by the species or by um, particular, particular amazing trees. So, you know, there's many ways to sort of connect into the, 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 the arboriculture, the tree side of things. And the on your doorstep, the what food can you grow? That at the moment in the UK has really got people thinking more about growing in nature and their connection to, to the natural world. Um, partially because with the pandemic, people realized that they're very dependent on shops and sometimes there were just items weren't there. And that really got people thinking, I think. Um, so, you know, in, in UK, people have been growing, including myself, you know, tomatoes in a pot, potatoes in a pot, herbs, um, but things that make sense locally um, and then making the connections to the site. Um, and one, one that helped here when people couldn't get out a lot because of the COVID restrictions, um, the British Trust for Ornithology um, made its garden bird survey, which is something it does every year. Um, and people had paid to, to put their data in about what birds they could see from their window. Um, it, it, it made that free to everybody and it, it helped people um, be, feel connected and raise awareness of the nature in their area. And given that you've got the uh, wetland with all the um, birds that are there, maybe, maybe there's a, a connection or a link that can be made that way too. And the other thing from our allotments uh, community we do a sharing of people's, uh, what people have done uh, through a very simple online newsletter. You know, people just send things in, somebody coordinates it, and then they just share that with the community of people who are interested. Um, and that just makes everybody um, feel positive and appreciated, which is good. <laughs> Mary, you might need to explain what allotments are. Yeah, it's a very yeah, yeah, British yeah. thing. Well, European maybe maybe because yeah. in Germany as well, yeah. Yeah, so um, again, for many years when people didn't have, uh, when people were turned off the land um, through um, uh, acts of parliament many centuries, several centuries ago, um, there was a way of helping people be able to feed themselves um, called the Allotments Acts, which meant that, especially in urban areas with the Industrial Revolution again, um, some areas of land were set aside so that the um, urban, urban people, urban workers, could grow some food for themselves. And because it's, it, they were given an, a, a portion of land, the, the, the word for that was, you know, you're given an allotment of land. And so they, the, the name of the process has become the name for the plot of land that people can grow food and things on. Um, but it, it's also turned into the concept of um, you know, um, incredible edibles where little pieces of land, uh, railway stations are turned into places where people can just, um, people grow food and people can share food in the UK. Um, so lots of different things, but that sort of growing food linking to the natural world, um, which, which nearly we're talking about as well. Great. Thank you so much for your insights, Mary, and for everyone's insights. And I know that we've already reached the three questions and we've actually gone beyond the time. So before I continue, uh, are the speakers here? Um, are you, do you have another engagement? Can we raise two more questions? Or don't, don't feel free to, to be honest. <laughs> of course, I'm, we understand. I'm... Mm -hmm. I'm happy to stay. 
Yeah, I'm happy for two more questions. Yeah, we understand that this is actually a very valuable time and this is not us um, usual that we get you guys together. So we'll just raise two questions from the audience. And thank you again for such great insights. Um, it's always uh, great to learn from international experts on the field because uh, we're not yet there, as mentioned, but we do hope to get there. And the, this is just really great to hear from you guys. I, I'm sure we're far from where you are or what you've achieved, um, but uh, consider this a thank you from a developing country such as the Philippines. Okay, so one question um, is, how are the computations done to show the clear financial benefits of urban parks? What are the base figures used and where do they come from? I guess this is really something that uh, is, is new to us. Yeah, maybe just because there is a lot of uh, information on, let's say, again, on on yeah, on yeah the web, in, as I can say, uh, tell you. But what is often used to have a kind of a, a transparent uh, methodology to calculate what they call ecosystem services, and huh? you can do it easily also for, for urban parks, it's the TEEP methodology. Uh, the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity (TEEB) methodology. You can uh, compare this, let's say, then with other regions in your own, let's say, continent, but also in the wider uh, world. This is, I think, a good, uh, let's say, me methodology to, to 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 start these calculations. So that's that's, I think, a very good and uh, an interesting thing to do. The other thing, uh, and that's of course what you already do, is of course to make the connection with universities, huh? because often uh, I think you can. L can have a lot of strength uh, uh, and empowerment through universities because uh, as I see it now, you, we are, let's say, the converted. We are already so excited of nature, but it's also good that it is, let's say, scientifically proved that what you do has a result, sometimes positive, sometimes negative. But if, let's say, scientists uh, really uh, research on what you are doing. It's a very interesting process that also can uh, internationally relate it and we can learn from each other from that. And that's, let's say, the basis of what, what we try to do. And that's maybe the last thing I can say about it. That's what it, I was introduced like uh, uh, that I created a model. It's a reconnection model. We are talking about reconnection. And the reconnection model is the re of the reconnection is between brackets because sometimes there is still connection with nature, but sometimes we, we lack the, 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 the connection, which is also in cities. And the reconnection model is, is based on four big sentences is reconnect nature with nature, reconnect people with nature reconnect business with nature, science with nature, and policy with practice. So what we try to do is an open source model. I say it's just more, let's, let's say, like a guidance of how we can do this. Uh, and when the other thing, maybe just a good thing to, to do is those who make decisions, bring them out of their offices, take them out to the city streets, take them out to plant a tree because yes. something beautiful can grow out of a small seed, like, like Mary said. So really, because if they make a decision behind their desks, they're still in a, in a clean environment with maybe a flowering pot, maybe, but often they don't have. So bring them out and show them because everybody was a, has children, most of us have children, and they want to have the best for their own children in the future. So bring them out, and it helps, I think. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you. Actually, I just remember that the National Park Service, the Legacy of America, was created from John Muir taking Theodore Roosevelt to Yosemite camping, right? So, so we need to bring these leaders out to nature. Actually, I want to ask our president, have you been climbing? Have you gone to our national parks? <laughs> but yeah, thank you so much. Um, does anyone want to add, Mary or Neil? Mm -hmm. I, yeah, look, I'll add a bit bit more. Uh, there, there are uh, environmental accounting standards uh, internationally that have been slowly being developed and uh, in certain countries, they've actually progressed that a lot more to actually be part of the uh, uh, financial uh, accounts or GDP, uh, gross domestic product uh, calculations. And, and they do sort of extend the sort of e ecosystem services um, calculations. Then there are a number of countries that have progressed economic benefit uh, modelling for, for parks, uh, Australia, New Zealand, 
Canada's got got one the the USA National Park Service and also the um, uh, City Parks Alliance uh, have actually got an interesting model. There's been great work out of the UK over the years as well of, of um, evaluating uh, parks. Um, so there are a, a range of different models. They, they can be reasonably adapted to different circumstances. I know that uh, uh, Jap Japan have adapted of elements from a few different countries, same with Korea. And also, I think Finland back probably about 10 years ago did some really interesting work in this this space including their um, urban um, uh, national parks uh, as well so yeah there, there, there's some really good uh, uh, models around and you might actually find that you've got some professor at one of the universities already working on it yeah Great. Thank you so much, Neil. And we're actually so thankful for everything that you've been adding, all the sources in the chat box for us to, to follow. I mean, it, it really helps to have all these psych materials, especially for us who are new here. Thank you. Um, how about you, Mary? Did you want to add anything or? Just echoing what's been said. Yeah. Um, the natural capital and the ecosystem services models um, are used in the UK as well. Um, and uh, yeah, as, as Neil says, probably um, in, in, within universities, there may well be people already doing those sorts of economic modelings. Um, so it may be worth reaching out to, to, to uh, universities as well. That's, that's really great. Actually, from this discussion, I want to read more on that <laughs> to familiarise ourselves with parks. So I guess um, I know that we've, we've already passed the time, but maybe we could take this last um, segment for, from any of you for last messages. How could we get more involved in parks? You could also share something about your own advocacy or what you're doing, how we could synergize. I'm sure that this isn't just about the Philippines, but a global movement that we should move towards to, right? Um, so any last words or... <laughs> So, Ignace, again, yes. again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would like to say something because um, if I look to the Philippines, you have already national parks. We were, let's say, in the 1990s with some friends, I was thinking of creating the first national park in Belgium. Uh, and we created a dream and we re realized the dream. Now we are thinking in Belgium of creating more national parks. That's what great. you are doing now is thinking about the creation of urban parks. And you have to believe in that. It's, it's well, maybe Mary said it as well. Eh? This is the taste of nature. Eh? This is the taste of nature that we feel and that you now, with, with, the, with the energy that you have with your people together and say, come on, we now go to a next phase of development where we, as we also are part of, let's say, the global community where we have uh, recognized and, and, and agreed on the sustainable development goals there is there is something to do and it's not only about decision makers it's about ourselves it's about our communities our our networks and we will take let's say spot on we, we, we would like to make our hands dirty like Neil said to make a beautiful future for ourselves and, and the future generations and it is possible it is possible if we take the courage and to, to energize each other. Also, if you have some failures, eh? a failure is possible, but see the bigger and the wider picture. And really, uh, I think the good thing is of today, and thank you again, that the, there is a world community. Eh? Meal is in Australia, Mary is in the UK, I'm in Belgium. There are so many people from across the world who are really willing to help you to create your dream because maybe in, in due time, we need you here in Belgium to help us again. Thank you. Thank you so much. For, and I'm sorry for my dog that barked, <laughs> but thank you so much for, for your message and for being here. That's really inspiring. Um, and that's why we're here, right? We power through, we, pa we, we power on, and we're, we're having the courage to start amidst all odds. Um, how about you, Neil? Yeah, just sort of following up on that, you know, taking that first step, which is what you've done, is basically just reaching out to people is really quite crucial. And and in fact, 
keep reaching out and uh, you can do that through World Urban Parks and World Urban Parks does actually connect with a lot of other global partners and, and while we've been on the on this webinar, I've been thinking about, you know, there's probably uh, a Rockefeller Resilient Cities um, uh, program that's probably happening in the Philippines. We're co highly connected into those sort of groups as well. So, so, so joining joining the the global, you know, community because uh, as it's been expressed, there are a lot of people willing to to help. And we've seen that through COVID-19, you know, some incredible people step up, provide leadership, share th their own stories. Um, in World Urban Parks, we, we have a lot of different committees that you might go, look, you know, some of those would be quite interesting. But one, one of the groups that we do have is called the Emerging Cities because the, the Global South challenges are, are dramatic and in fact, well, one of the things that I think you need to sort of dwell on is that the number of people who are going to live in cities in the world is going to double in the next 35 years. So basically, we haven't built half the cities that we're going to live in. So we're at this moment of time of actually, we could get it right for 50% of the people a lot better than we have in the past. So, so there's this huge opportunity. The thing is, you've you've actually got to reach out and and learn. And and I, as I sit here, I keep thinking, oh, there there are places that you should be learning about, like the Eden Project in the UK, which would give you ideas on socio-economic type things. Looking at how Canberra, which which is one of the most best designed cities in the world in terms of the landscape how they did it, what it meant. But then you actually go look at how people are retrofitting their cities that, that haven't worked very well. And there are really good examples around the world. Um, there, there's there's a great couple of great examples in, in America, you know, where they've actually, you know, over the last 40, 50 years, turned their cities around because they're focused on their, their green space, their nature. Uh, in their cities. Um, so there's really fantastic uh, things out there just to learn from. And as Ignace has said, there is so technology. You probably get a lot of people who would like to actually talk about what they've done and their experiences. And you can learn a lot through that process. Thank you so much. You mentioned about keep reaching out. And I just want to say thank you to all of you three. Now we reached out and even from Far away from the Philippines, you said yes to being a part of this and sharing your very valuable insights. So thank you so much. We will take all of these. And, and I think Laya and the NPF team, this is a goal signal for us, or, or actually an encouragement to be part of the World Urban Parts Association. We need to be a part. <laughs> I actually also saw the academy. There's a World Urban Parks Academy that certifies urban parks um, uh, um, individuals, and I'm very interested to apply. <laughs> so uh, thank you. <laughs> I, I might just mention about that. Yes, yeah, there is a uh, uh, professional accreditation program that we run, uh, yeah, which is World uh, Parks Academy, and that that really is focused on, especially the emerging cities, because uh, mo most developed nations generally do have a fairly good university-based system and accreditation-based system, but a lot of places around the world haven't. We do actually have a lot of really good partners and, and Mary actually mentioned one of them, you know, the Green Flag, the International Green Flag Award. We work really closely with them because they're actually another tool mechanism to actually understand where you're at. And it's a reasonably, well, it is a very robust process, but it, but it's also very engaging. So the people who run it, who work really closely with us, actually do share a lot of really good uh, insights. Um, so there are a lot of other opportunities through the network um, into other um, programs run by other uh, entities as well. Thank you so much. And we look forward to looking into the World Parks Academy and the association itself. Mary? for the last words. Yeah, thank you. I think I'm unmuted. Um, 
just speaking personally, I've found the World Urban Parks to be really fantastic. Um, as I've explained at the start, I didn't start in urban parks. I've, I've come into the sector uh, sort of halfway through my career. And one of the things that I did was, was, was look on the internet to find out what was available. And the organisation that now is called World Urban Parks uh, was there. I joined it and I've learned so much from being involved in those networks and the, the, the friendships as well um, that develop um, are, are amazing. So um, I know it's a plug, but um, it, it, it is a really good network to get part of. And also the Green Flag Award Scheme. Um, that's an award scheme that uh, is like a benchmark for, for good and excellent quality parks. If you take those standards into account when you're working with people to design your park, um, you'll find that really, really useful. But also um, the, the process of uh, applying and being assessed is a peer-to-peer -peer review process. Um, I've just been uh, judging uh, two parks in Germany um, with my co co-judge me not there but doing it through the web with her um really interesting and very educational so uh, it's a way to learn and share and connect across the world so um, i commend that too thank you thank you so much and it's been such a great uh, discussion with all of you i actually look forward to hearing more from you guys even after this and the i'm sure the the participants would agree uh, I see comments. Thanks for this wonderful webinar. Learned a lot. Thank you so much. Very informative and active discussion. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Actually, I think there's so much thanks and I would leave also the closing uh, to NPF, but in behalf of the Philippines, I'm sure, I mean, we're representing the Philippines as Filipinos. We thank you three. Hopefully, you know, when the, the urban park, the, the NPF has been transformed into an urban park, we can even invite you here here in the philippines all of you guys three have not been here yet so maybe one day you will see that into fusion and you can say that you had a part to play and i'm sure that we could have more engagements from this session and beyond so thank you again to all of you three beyond our hearts and for the philippines um so laya thank you thank you nella uh am i on mute no, I'm not. All right. Uh, thank you, Nella, and thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, from the Nayan Pilipina Foundation, we would like to thank Neil McCarthy, Mary Worrell, and Ignaz Shops. Thank you so much for the generosity. You have shared with us many insights we will take to heart and questions also that we need to confront. Um, thank you to all those who attended up to the third episode of the series of multi-sectoral consultations. Definitely, this is not the last conversation about making your cities more are livable through urban parks. This calls for a multi-sectoral effort and we agree we can start with our homes to recover our connection with the natural world. Surely we will do everything we can to tap the right experts to calculate the benefits of parks so that we can properly inform decision makers the benefits. So apart from this, we want more collaborations also to make sure that our plans are latte. Uh, as we utilize research data and available international standards and sustainable models, we want to enable communities to have a voice and greater citizen engagement, and that's you, attendees, and all your networks. We need, really need more allies. Uh, together, let us dream for urban parks and realize these dreams. Let us claim the Nayong Filipino Park as our legacy for future generations, and not just in Manila, not just in Nayong Filipino, but probably several municipalities across the archipelago. So with that, I thank you everyone. Have a good day and cheers to a great weekend.